So let's just reflect on that individual that I was asked to look after two years ago um, and what, what can we do? And, and this is the STASCIS trial, the Surgical Trial in Acute Spinal Cord Injury Study. And this is a, um, a collaborative effort across uh, uh, North America. The initial seed funding, of which was actually provided by the Kremble uh, Foundation. Um, and, and subsequently, we've been able to really galvanize support from a variety of, of foundations across North America. So what this shows, and I'll just kind of highlight the results. So this is a graph, and on the y-axis, um, we see the percentage of recovery on an outcome measure called the American Spinal Injury Association score. And on the bottom, you'll see that there's either no improvement, uh, there's what's called a one-grade improvement, and this is a five-grade scale, or a two- or more-grade improvement, and, and changes of two or more grades are considered to be very large treatment effects. And so what the graph is showing is that if we compare individuals who undergo an early effort at, at, uh, at surgical intervention versus situations where either surgery is not done or it's done in a very delayed fashion, we see that we're influencing the tail end of this recovery curve and that we're seeing a much higher percentage of recovery of two or more grades. And what this means kind of in non-statistical terms is that one out of five patients is walking away from an injury that they would not normally walk away from. So this is what this means. This is about a 20% reduction in disability. It's not a cure from spinal cord injury, but it's potentially a start, and at least it gives people the opportunity to achieve um, in improved recovery. And so what we have shown, um, and this is really novel data for the first time, is that firstly, early surgical intervention is safe. There were many concerns that it would not be safe. This can be done now. It's not easy, but the protocols are established. And I spent a lot of my time traveling around the world, talking to, uh, uh, to doctors and various groups about how to implement this, the, the STASCIS protocol. And the data um, uh, appear quite convincing that we can uh, reduce the amount of secondary disability after a spinal cord injury and also reduce complications in the intensive care unit. So this is an initial start. Now, in terms of um, this idea of neuroprotection, there have been some initial trials that have been done which have shown some promise. They, these are the NASCIS and the GM1 trials, which, have, which showed that steroids had a modest effect uh, in injury. But what these have really provided us with is the framework to move forward. So Riliazole is the drug that I mentioned. This is FDA approved in ALS, and it's far from a cure in ALS. There's no question about that. But it tends to slow down the rate of nerve cell degeneration. And how does it work? It works by blocking sodium entry into the cell. So what happens is when you injure tissue, and you think about when you bruise your arm, the tissue swells. It swells because sodium en enters the cell and it carries water with it. This, in addition to causing cell swelling, triggers a cascade of events that culminates in cell injury. Riliazole, though, is off patent, and uh, it's not attractive for drug companies to take off patent molecules forward, but it's very attractive for society because the costs of a spinal cord injury are very high. So, for example, the individual that I, that I was talking about is we are potentially looking at lifetime costs of, of five to ten million dollars for that individual. And so, you know, even getting, for example, hand function back would have an enormous impact on quality of life and on reducing caregiver burden and reducing other associated uh, costs. So what these slides show is that the recovery curves with Riliazole are much higher from a functional perspective and we're getting much better tissue preservation. So what's occurred now is that this is now starting to move forward and that governments and, and agencies, again, such as the on, on Ontario government and Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation, have recognized the need to support clinical research networks to take forward ideas that are very promising, but where we may not um, uh, have um, 
uh, 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 companies interested in doing this. So this is about to move forward, and uh, we're very close to moving this forward in, in uh, Toronto, and we've created a network among the Toronto hospitals, and this will also be taken forward across uh, North America. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about uh, a genetic engineering, and I'm going to return back to this slide that, that, that Dr. Tatter and I worked on in the late 1980s. And this is, what this shows is that there's a destruction of the blood vessels in the injured spinal cord. And ultimately, if we're going to try to repair the injured spinal cord in a meaningful way, we're going to have to revascularize the spinal cord. We're going to have to grow these blood vessels back. And that's not so easy to do. So, so the approach that we have taken is, is using a remarkable form of gene therapy. And this, this is, takes advantage of, of so-called zinc finger protein transcriptional factors. And that's a big word. But what this means is that these are molecules that will bind to areas of the DNA and they will then cause the cell to produce all of the different proteins. And this is important because proteins can be expressed in many forms. So for example, vascular endothelial growth factor, which is critical to the formation of blood vessels, comes in at least 12 isoforms. So which one do you choose if you're just going to introduce that one? But with this technology, you get all of them expressed in a natural way. And so this has now been moved forward in animal models. We're able to introduce this with a high degree of efficiency into the spinal cord. We're able to grow uh, blood vessels. This is what's meant by the angiogenic effect, and these are slides and special stains that show uh, the introduction of the blood vessels. We're able to reduce the amount of cell death. Uh, apoptosis refers to genetically programmed cell death, and here we see in the recovery curves that we see much less programmed cell death, and we can achieve functional uh, recovery. And so this is now very promising. Uh, this uh, technology is actually moving forward in clinical trials in the U.S. in a condition called diabetic neuropathy. It looks like it's safe, and so um, it's showing some promise there, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to take this forward into clinical trials in man. Now, there are a variety of forms of cell-based therapies or stem cells. They come in many flavors, and we can think about um, embryonic stem cells, Schwann cells are the cells from the peripheral nerves, olfactory and sheathing cells come from the, from the nasal epithelium, mesenchymal stem cells come from the bone marrow, uh, what, there are, are stem cells even in the skin, and then there are neural stem cells. And if we had a choice, if we were trying to repair the brain or the spinal cord, we would want to go with neural stem cells as opposed to something that really wasn't derived from the nervous system. The challenge has been, well, how do we get those neural stem cells? And, and there, there are some very exciting possibilities and, and solutions uh, to do that. Uh, so what this is showing, and this is a, tr a, a Canadian discovery, uh, both from Toronto and Calgary, Derek Vanderkoy and Sam Weiss. And what they found for the first time back in the early 1990s is that the adult brain and the adult spinal cord has stem cells. So the idea that our brain and spinal cord stop developing uh, after we're born is wrong. There are endogenous stem cells which are, which are present. It's, it's, you know, if we could ultimately try to enhance those endogenous stem cells, that would be amazing. And there are efforts underway um, in our team in Toronto to do this. But what, the, what we have also shown here is that we can uh, uh, isolate these uh, neural stem cells and we can study them in the, in the laboratory. In addition, in parallel with this, there are now proof of concept data that neural stem cells can be applied safely in man. And this is um, some work um, that a California biotech company has, has done in a condition uh, called Batten's disease. And these are children that are born with a critical en enzyme deficiency where the neural stem cells have been used to introduce these, these, these genes. 